Hello, I am Pat Allen and uh, I am here today at uh, Cincinnati State's Branch Campus in Middletown, Ohio to interview Mr. Terry Will, um, a Vietnam veteran and we're doing this for the Library of Congress in Washington and we're doing this under the auspices of the Hamilton, Cin Hamilton County Cincinnati uh, Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, the program is under the local direction of Brian Powers and our area cameraman today is uh, David Killen from Cincinnati State. Mr. Will, first of all, thank you for doing this interview and thank you for your service. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, well, let, let's just start out by telling, uh, telling the folks uh, when you were born and where you were born. I was born October 12, 1948 in Middletown, Ohio at the old Middletown Hospital. And uh, when was that? That was October 12, 1948. What were your parents' names? My dad was Tommy Wills and my mother was Barbara Wills. And do you remember when they got married? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what did your dad do for, for a living? My dad was a professional musician. He played saxophone starting at age 16, and he played until he was 88 when he could no longer play it because he said his breathing wasn't correct to play it. Oh, wow. He played a lot of clubs, a lot of Holiday Inns. He played uh, Little Nashville in Indiana. He met a lot of famous people, Kenny Rogers, Dolly Parton. He's got pictures of him with him, and yeah, he George Jones. He met he met a lot of uh, famous uh, musicians uh, George, over his lifetime. George is probably my favorite uh, country singer. Uh, is your dad still with us? No, uh, Dad died in October at age 93. This this past October. This past October, he oh. was uh, always healthy until the last couple years of his life, and he had some heart problems, and then uh, he passed. Where, where was he from? Was he in Middletown? Yeah, he was born and raised in Middletown, Ohio, uh, in a farm in West Middletown, out by the Sportsman's Club. And then um, he, uh, uh, he, my mom and he lived over on Winona Drive over here in Lakeside. All right. Uh, while, uh, while your folks were married, did uh, your mom work outside the home? No, mom, mom never worked. Um, Mom, mom and dad uh, got a divorce when I was very small and I went to live a year in Cincinnati in Deer Park with my aunt and uncle Charlie and Aunt Dot and uh, then went over to Otterbein home for about a year and then my grandparents uh, couldn't take it anymore coming over to see me so they ended up adopting me back in the days when they could get guardianship and just take me home. Okay. I started living with them from second grade all the way through high school. And, th and that was here in Middletown? That was here in Middletown. They lived on Grand Avenue. If I remember right, the Otterbein home was over near uh, Lebanon, wasn't it's it? It's on Lebanon, I think uh, 741, thereabouts. Building I stayed at with all the other kids still there. And um, uh, I had, I know, I, the only thing I remember about that was they used to line us up and march us over every morning to the, a place called Marble Hall across 741. They used to give us a tablespoonful of castor oil and a one-a-day vitamin. <laughs> and that's all I remember about that, about Otterbein home. And Marble Hall is still there. That was, uh, mm -hmm. that was Union Village, a Shaker community back in the old days. All right, uh, so where did you go to grade school? Went to grade school from, uh, went uh, first grade at Deer Park in Cincinnati when, when I lived with my aunt and uncle. Then I went second grade all the way through high school here in Middletown. I went to um, elementary school at Wilson, the old Wilson School on Highview Road. And I went to junior high school at the old Roosevelt School, which is no longer there on Central Avenue. That would have been seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And then I went to high school at the old high school downtown, which is now Vail Middle School, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And when did you graduate high school? 1966. Did you have any uh, further formal education after high school? Yes, I did. What was that? Um, I, um, uh, the summer after graduation, I got a job, temporary service manpower, and we, um, they were building Miami University Middletown campus at the time. And they were building Logan T. Johnson Hall and Dave Finkelman Auditorium and uh, the Gardner Library at the time. And uh, those were the only three uh, buildings on campus. And you registered for class up at the Holiday House 
up the White House up on the hill is where they had their administrative offices while they were building the campus. So what did you do? What were, what One of my work? jobs was I unloaded trucks and I put the file cabinets and the desks and all the furniture in Logan Johnson Hall and the library and uh, not so much the auditorium. I didn't have too much to do with the auditorium then. All right. So I was in the first class when they opened up uh, Miami University Middletown and I went there that year of 66 and part of 67 and uh, and then uh, wasn't doing too well in school, didn't like it that much. I liked to party too much back then, <laughs> not, not too much in the studies. And so um, back then the draft was on for Vietnam and you had deferments back then. You had a 2S deferment for as a student in school, which is what I had at the time. You had an agricultural deferment if you were the only son you could help dad on the farm and you had a theological deferment if you were a student in a seminary or a, a religious capacity. Well, when I left school, I became 1A draft eligible and eligible for the jungles of Vietnam. And I said, I'm not going to go to the jungles of Vietnam, but if I have to go in the military, at least I'm going to choose. So I chose the Air Force for four years rather than have be drafted for two years and probably carry an M16, go to the jungles of Vietnam, and maybe get killed, and I really didn't want to do that. <laughs> Before we get into your military, we probably ought to talk a little bit about your grandparents that, that raised you. What were their names? William Stillwall Sr. and Katie Stillwall. Uh, my granddad, who raised me, he was like my dad, and uh, he was a tough old uh, tobacco-chewing, uh, camel, no-filter, uh, Cincinnati beer-drinking steel man and he w ran a four high temper mill out at Armco Steel in West Processing. All right. Grandma never worked, she didn't have to. Grandpa made real good money back then. Okay. And uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they were very, uh, because they lived through the dep depression and they lost a house over on Park Street, they were very, uh, uh, they were spendthrifts and they uh, really watched their money. Grandma handled the money, Grandpa came home on payday, laid it on the kitchen table, Grandma took the money off the kitchen table. <laughs> he gave him an allowance. And, <laughs> and, and uh, all he cared about was his, his beer, his Camel or Lucky Strike cigarettes, watching an occasional Reds game. But he worked shift work for 46 years out there until he retired. All right. Yeah. Um, do you have brothers and sisters or were you only child? No, on, only child. All right. And are you married? I was married. My wife passed away two months ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes. What was her name? Her name was Kathleen, uh, when, Kathy. When did you and Kathleen marry? We, um, when, when I was still on base uh, about a year before I got out of the Air Force, I was at Rickenbacker Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I was in the parking lot and all of a sudden this group of people walked up and Kathy was in amongst the group of people and so we struck up a conversation and we, I asked her to go have some ice cream that day, I remember that. And uh, then, then we didn't see each other for a long time and our first impressions of each other were not the greatest. I thought she was a little hippie girl and she thought I was a stuck up snob. And so we stayed away for a while and then all of a sudden I called her and asked her out. We started going out on a regular basis uh, and then um, we ended up getting married May 6th of 72 and we got our first apartment in Columbus, Ohio, a little one bedroom, one bath, galley kitchen, uh, small apartment uh, for $110 a month back then and we didn't know how we were gonna afford that. <laughs> and so then we graduated to a double at $135 a month up in Columbus in, in a, an area of Columbus called Bexley. And then we bought our first house on Towers Court North in Columbus, it was a story and a half Cape Cod Korean War era built in the 50s type home. And uh, we were tickled to death at, and again, we couldn't, uh, we just didn't know how we were gonna afford the whopping $204 a month house payment, but we did. And so I started working at a place called Crane Plastics in Columbus, a vinyl extrusion company, still there. What, how do you spell Crane? C-R-A-N-E. <clears throat> what did you uh, do for them? I, I did, I ran a forklift. I was an assistant stockman taking supplies to the extrusion lines. I ran an extruder in production. 
and uh, I did quality control audit work, end of line audit for fin finished product before they nailed the crate shut, the crate shut and send it to the customer. But the biggest thing I did at the end was I did research and development work in plastics. That was my second stint in the lab in the Air Force in Dav at Davis Monthan before I went to Vietnam. I did fuels lab testing. They, that was started my lab career. And I worked pretty much in labs throughout my whole life. Okay. And finishing up after 48 years back in October. Well, when you met Kathy, were, were you stationed at Rickenbacker? I was. All I right. was at Rickenbacker. That was my last duty station before I got out after four years. But then, uh, did they let you live off, off base then? Yeah, yeah, okay. you, yeah. You could live off base as an NCO. All right. Yes. Well, I I, uh, I was born in Columbus and lived in Bexley myself. Did you? Yeah. Okay. Back in the 40s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when uh, you and Kathy were married, uh, did she work outside the home? Yes. What did she when, do? When I, when I met her, she worked in downtown Columbus working for the, the Girl Scouts and uh, while I was working for Crane Plastics and then she took another job with more pay and better benefits and she worked for Motors Insurance Company in right. downtown Columbus and then she worked from that she transitioned to a MOAC, Marine Office Appleton and Cox. It was another high risk insurance company and she worked usually in administration. Was that in Columbus? That was in Columbus. That was close to the Motors building in downtown Columbus and uh, all that time I was working for Crane and then uh, in 1979, I took a job in Newark, Ohio with a company called Mobay Chemical. And I worked in a plastics polycarbonate compounding facility uh, doing physical property testing on polycarbonate plastics. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about okay. your, your post-military uh, working career. Mm -hmm. But let's, uh, let's talk about your, your enlistment. You decided you were going to enlist in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any relatives that had been in the military? Yes. Um, my, uh, my uncle, uh, Bill, was a fighter pilot. F he flew F4U Corsairs uh, in World War II and in Korea. Did and that have any influence on you uh, joining the Air Force? No, no, not so much. Actually, my cousin had gone in the Air Force prior to that, and I had talked to my cousin about how it was if I ever had to go in the military. And what he explained to me seemed doable for me. And so uh, that kind of guided me into the Air Force, okay. my cousin. Uh, did you say your uncle uh, flew the fighter plane? He was a Marine Corps pilot, did, yes. Did he make it through uh, both conflicts? He did, and he, he later became a pilot, corporate pilot for Armco Steel for right. 22 years, flying the big shots around in the Kansas City plant and all the different plants they had at the time. So did he, uh, Armco Steel's main, uh, main production facility is here in Middletown. Is that where he worked and he flew out? Yes, of he flew out little, of the local airport. Little, I think it's Cook, Cook Airfield. Yeah, he yeah. yeah he flew out of the Armco <laughs> hangar that they had set up there at the at the local airport. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, when you enlisted, where did you sign up? I signed up um, at the Dollar Building in downtown Hamilton, Ohio. All right, and uh, after you signed up, where did they send you? Well, they sent me to Amarillo, Texas, which was unusual because at the time I went in. The normal place to go through Air Force basic training is Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. But at the time, Lackland had a um, had an outbreak of meningitis, oh. so they sent all of us up to Amarillo as overflow to keep us away from the meningitis. Well, and how, how long were you there? Uh, six weeks. Six week basic training. Yeah, what what kind of basic training did you have in the Air Force at uh, that base? Well, I, we had a lot of marching. We had the rifle range. We had to disassemble and reassemble the M16 at the rifle range. We had the classes indoctrinating us into the Air Force, military life. We had to learn to salute. We had to learn to march. We had to learn to go through the, the chow hall line correctly, sidestepping. You just didn't walk through like you do in civilian life. <laughs> and we, we, had to, we had to run a mile. We had qualification day. We had to go through obstacle courses. Going through, I had to put a had to don a mask and go through a smoking building. Had to crawl underneath concertina wire. About that time, were you fearful that you were going to be and in that I, infantry? No, I, I, I'm actually I made it. Um, actually, uh, 
you want to get out of basic training as soon as you can. You did not, do not want to be put back any time because it was not a real enjoyable situation. The DI was yelling at you, a team of them were yelling at you all the time. And, um, and so I, I remember running a mile with 102 degree temperature just to get out of there. I actually should have gone to sick call, but I wanted out of there so bad, I went ahead and ran it with a fever. One time we had a clothing inspection. When you go in the military, after a few days you have clothing issue. And they go through and they measure you and they give you your fatigues and your boots and your underpants and everything else. And so one of the things in the clothing issue were inspected by number 10 tags. And you had to remove all of those inspection tags. And you had to hang them a certain way, all to the left, everything buttoned, two fingers apart with each hanger. And so they would come in and they would inspect inspect you, see, see how your underwear was folded, how your clothes were hung, if all the buttons were done. Well, they would come in the night before and everybody was sleeping and they would plant these inspection tags just to make an example out of somebody. I happened to be one of the ones that they made an example out of. Uh, and so uh, I had a TI about an inch from my nose holding inspection by number tag, ten, uh, by, num by number 10 tag up in my face saying, what is this? And his eyes were this big, scaring me to death. It's all motivation by fear. That's how they did things. <laughs> Indoctrinated you from civilian life to military. And so, you know, it's, sir, I don't, I don't know what that is. I took all the tags out. It was right in the shirt pocket, so it would have been. He says, I'll tell you what, Wills, I want 1,000 of these tags made by 0600 in, in the morning. So now I have another problem. Lights are out at nine o'clock and everybody's in their bunk and you better not be out of your bunk or else. So lights go out, that night lights go out at nine o'clock and I'm scared to death and can't sleep anyway. I gotta get a thousand inspected by number 10 tags to this, this buck sergeant by 0600 hours in the morning. So here I am out in the hallway, I found a pad of paper, found a pencil, found a, he said he wanted them the same size. So I found a ruler, don't know how, don't remember how I found them, but I did. And I made, I got a bag to put them all in, don't know where they all came from, made a thousand inspected by number 10 tags. Well, while I was doing that, the staff sergeant, the team leader came up the stairs, he was half lit from drinking at the local bars. And I stood up at attention when he came up the stairs and he says, what the hell are you doing out of bed, boy? And I, Sir. Sorry, Williams wanted me to make a thousand specs by number 10 tags by 0600. Oh, go to bed. Now I'm in the quandary. I got one DI wanting all these tags. I got another one telling me to go to bed. And when I, he, he ain't going to remember in the morning he told me to go to bed. So I'm, as soon as he, I hear the door shut, I'm out there in the hallway where the only light is because the rooms are pitch black. And I'm making a thousand while well, I have them done. I went, go in, you hit one time on the door, no more than one time, get in here. I go in, make a right, right face, holding the bag up, sir, Airman Wills reports as ordered, sir, you know, 1,000 inspected by number 10 takes as ordered by 0600. He says, he takes them, he, I, he looked kind of astonished that I even had them, I don't even know if he remembered, but he took them out of my hand, he says, Wills, I'm gonna count every one of these and there better be a 1,000 in there or else. Yes, sir. Did an about face went out. As I was going out the room, I looked out my peripheral vision and he threw them. They were laughing at, with the other TIs that he got me to do it. And he threw it in a garbage can. <laughs> but it was as the games that they played with guys at basic to motivate you. Yeah. Where'd they send you from yeah. basic? Well, from Amarillo, I went to Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. I went there as a electronic digital data processing repairman was my title. I was going to fix computers. And I told him, I said, I don't have the electronic aptitude to do computers. I really don't. Yeah, but you scored real well on your electronics test before you came in, so now you're a candidate for electronic school. But I don't know a resistor from a capacitor, from a diode, from a circuit. Yeah, you will, you'll learn. About two weeks into the course, the tech sergeant teaching the course says, you're not doing real well. And I said, Sergeant, I told way back before I went into basic training, I was not, elect not an electronics candidate. He says, what would you like to do? And I said, I don't know. He says, let's go see the Colonel. So I'm in there as an airman, one striper, uh, meeting with a bird Colonel. 
uh, just a, a couple months into my enlistment, scared to death. And uh, he says, what'd you like to do? And, he, and I said, I, I really don't know. What do you have to offer? He says, how would you like to go into fuels? And he says, you would be at Davis Monthan in Tucson, Arizona. And I said, okay, I'll try it. I said, but is it tech school or is it on the job training? He says, on the job training. I said, I do well at on the job training. I do not do well sitting in a classroom. I'd rather be shown and do than to be taught out of a book. So I did. I went there. I did real well. I went through my uh, all my training. I got a three level. I got a five level. I made buck sergeant three stripes. Uh, went over to Vietnam. Out so of, while you were still you know, at the uh, base in, where was it? In Davis Month in Tucson, Arizona. Tucson, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you you raised all those ranks uh, while you're there in Tucson. No, no I went to one. Uh, I was a two striper, a two striper, and I got my airman first class two stripes and my buck sergeant E four three stripes at Davis Monthan. Okay. Yes, and then and then I got sent to Vietnam, and after Vietnam, uh, I took a, what they called a weighted airman's performance test. It's a WAPS test. It was new. I, I was in the first class that took it. Must have done well, never did hear my score, but I got E5 staff sergeant from that test. Okay. So I made E5 in three years and two months, which is minimal time and grade. Okay. So I did real well for myself. Well, when did they send you over to Vietnam? Uh, before you went to Vietnam, did you get some time to, to come home? Uh, yes, I got 30 days leave to come home and then I got 30 days leave after I came back, yes. All right, so mm -hmm. uh, when you went to uh, Nam, where did you leave from? Um, um, trying to think here. Um, my uncle, let's see, Davis Monthan, and then uh, left out of, uh, left out of Dayton, as a matter of fact. Left out of Dayton on, on um, yeah, I flew to Travis Air Force Base in California. All right. Uh, from Travis Air Force Base, we were in the transient quarters. Got on the airplane. It was a Braniff uh, Airlines at that time. Flew us over. First stop was Hawaii to refuel. Did you get off the plane in Hawaii? Uh, yes. Matter of fact, got off the plane. Pitch dark. They said, stay at the airport, or don't leave the airport, it'll be a few minutes to refuel, we're about right back on the plane. So I was there pitch black in Hawaii, the lights of the airport, I was out on a deck, I remember I was on, out on a, on a porch, and there was a nice balmy breeze and one palm tree and white sand. I remember that. And that's all I got to see of Hawaii. <laughs> pitch black, about 50 feet out, and a palm tree, no ocean. No sun, no surroundings. Just got back on the plane, flew from Hawaii to um, Philippines. Got deplaned at the Philippines, refueled, got back on the plane. Same scenario, don't leave the airport. Don't leave the airport, we're, get, we're getting on the plane. Flew to Guam, island hopping, refueled. Don't, get, don't leave the airport, getting back on the plane from Guam on into Vietnam, landed to Tonsonut in Saigon. All right. And did you land there in the daytime, nighttime? Landed, landed in the daytime, yep. And when you got off the plane, what hit you? The heat? Well, yeah, the, well, um, actually what I noticed immediately about that was the uh, third world country look to the place. Um, things were not necessarily manicured, things were not necessarily clean, things were not necessarily um, sanitary. They had open uh, ditches on the side of the roads where there was sewage. All right. uh, there was a lot of um, huts made out of various materials. Um, there, was, uh, there was very tall grass like you'd see growing in tropical climates on both sides of the road. Uh, Some wasn't, guys wasn't have it, referred to it as elephant grass? Yes, yeah, it could be elephant grass. Well, it, 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 was a, it was a wide bladed grass. I don't know if it was specifically elephant grass right. or not, but it was a wide bladed grass. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they had a, um, 
and then and then they took us to our our barracks area and all those were were uh, summer huts with um, with uh, enclosed they were screened in because of the mosquitoes and then you had bunk beds and it was partitioned off you had a middle aisle that you walked down and then you had plywood partitions uh, all the way down the length of the hut on both sides of the middle aisle and they were for give you a little pri a little privacy partitioned off like that um, uh, you had um, you had open rafters in the in the hut and you had a couple of fans going, which didn't do too much for you at a 114 degrees. What was the flooring? Flooring was, it was <laughs> wood floors, wood was floors it? in the huts. It was just like a summer camp. You had a day room where they had a, a, a television and it was Armed Forces Network. And they, I, I remember every day like clockwork, many episodes of Star, the old original Star Trek <laughs> and Wild Wild West with uh, Jim Conrad and uh, I don't know, Artemis Gordon, but they had, uh, I forget the actor's name now, but they had Wild Wild West and Star Trek for the main, and they had a community refrigerator, and you bought cans of pop, and you put your initials on the cans of pop. That didn't keep people from taking them, but... That's so all you had. That's all you had. So well, was you, this, was the wood on the ground, or were, were these raised up off the no, ground? No, it, it was elevated. Okay. It, it was elevated some. Yeah, it, they were elevated. <laughs> And you had a screen door that had a spring on it that would always open it and it would flop. It would pound against the, the door frame every time somebody went in, went in and out. Uh, in, the, in each cubicle you had bunk beds and you had metal lockers, metal locker for each person. Uh, around the bunk beds you had mosquito netting for your, obviously to protect you at night when you're trying to sleep from, from mosquitoes. You were also issued orange pills for malaria. Right. You had to take orange pills for malaria. Every day? Every day. You were, you were supposed to take them. Nobody was there to make you take them. You were just supposed to take them. Did you? Uh, no. I took them for a while and then I just, nah, just quit taking them. We had a, a centralized community shower toilet area, bathroom area. In a separate building? In a separate building. You walked out of your, out of your hut and you walked Oh, I don't know, uh, for us, depending on where your hut was, for us, you walked to 50 feet and you were out or you were, you went in to uh, use the restroom facilities or you went in to shower. The shower head was a big room that had shower heads all the way around the perimeter and it sloped in the middle and it had one central drain. And you dare not go in there barefoot because you didn't know what was on the floor. There was all kinds of stuff on the floor. So you wore shower clogs like the kids wear nowadays every day you see so we wore them just to protect our feet from uh -huh. whatever was growing on the floor so um, so you went in there to do that um, barracks the barracks had had no uh, restroom facilities you had to go to the community restroom well how long were you at that base one year oh so you, all Thompson the time you were there was the same Hood. place same place same barracks did the same actually did different jobs. Started out there driving a fuel truck, refueling aircraft. Uh, they, had, they had a fuels group, a fuels truck parking lot, and they had a building on the parking lot, and the building was air conditioned, and in that building was where the, uh, the CEO, of the um, uh, commanding officer sat uh, of the group, and, and uh, also the dispatcher and the dispatcher was in a separate room that was air conditioned and didn't have computers back then. So what you did was you had three hot phones, uh, three phones, one of them was hot. One of them you just picked up, there was no dial on it or anything and that was from, that was General's Planes and uh, VIP type phone. We need it now because the General's Planes is going to take off, that kind of thing. The other phones were just routine base calls. Um, I started out over there in my uh, first part of my year in Vietnam refueling aircraft out on the flight line. I refueled transports that took uh, supplies out to uh, the, the fire bases, okay. took food and took uh, refueled some planes that had the 55 gallon drums of Agent, Agent Orange, Orange on them, the C-123 providers that sprayed. So when you say you refueled those, what did you 
you help to load the barrels onto the uh, no 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 the barrels were taken care of by a, by a different different group uh, I I had drove a refueling truck I pulled up to the aircraft um, I got out of the truck uh, I put the pumping gear in I put chalks in the wheels and I took grounding wires you had to have a three point ground so you ground you took one grounding wire and you put it to a loop that was in the concrete in the ground another to the front landing gear of the aircraft that's a three point ground ground the truck truck the aircraft they were all grounded to, because you were handling JP fuel Ford jet fuel or you were handling handling 115 145 Av gas reciprocating fuel for the prop jobs. Uh, uh, so, uh, you or you had an oil truck. We had an oil truck for the reciprocating engines. When they started those reciprocating engines, all kinds of smoke and oil came out of them. So you had to constantly have an oil truck out there on the flight line. So, did you refuel uh, helicopters too? Many helicopters. I refueled gunships. I refueled uh, forward air control aircraft. I refueled help refuel the largest cargo plane in the Air Force inventory at the time, a C-141 Starlifter. I refueled C-130s, which were turboprops, which took uh, JP-4 jet fuel. I refueled C-7A Caribou's uh, cargo, C-123 cargo, um, C-54s, the Korean uh, Air Force had over there, a couple of them put fuel on those. Uh, those were prop jobs. Um, C-46s, um, they had F-101 Voodoo's. Those were primarily fighters, but they were a recon unit and they had a box, a plexiglass plate in the nose. And those took pictures, they were recons. They would fly over an area and take pictures of the topography. Uh -huh. So we had a squadron of those. Um, one of the more interesting planes I refueled was um, C-119s, they're the old flying box cars but they were called shadows and they were all camouflaged in browns and whites and blacks and they only flew at night they never flew day missions and they were gunships they were like I refueled Puff the Magic Dragon the C-47 that had all these five cannons or gatling guns that were synchronized and they could put a round in about every square inch of a football field that was concentrated firepower when the field guys out in the field were pinned down, had enemy troops around, they called uh -huh. these gunships out, and they took care of everything. They took, they took out everything in a given area. They were deadly. Now they have Spectre gunships. They were, they're C-130s that are, are equipped to be gunships. But so I have the, pictures those of prop them plane, that Was that a prop plane? Yeah, C-119s were prop planes. I have pictures of them in that album. Uh, and I have a how calling many, card. How many engines did they have? They had two. Two? Mm-hmm. C-119s had two. C-47 Puff had two. Uh, how many crewmen would be on those? Uh, well, you had a pilot, you had a co-pilot, you had a navigator, and you have, had one sitting in the back with the guns, taking uh, care of the ammunition and taking care of the synchronization. So were those automatically fired, all those guns? Yes, they, yeah, they, were, they were synchronized with the system. They don't let you in the aircraft. At the time, that was technology that was not to be seen. That's, right. they didn't want anybody inside the aircraft. But you saw the cannons, the, the Gatling guns sticking out the uh -huh. side of the aircraft. Well, how about the helicopters? Uh, were you in an area where you had to refuel any helicopters that had been shot up? Or? No, no, none were shot up, but, but uh, I put a lot of fuel on uh, Cobra gunships, on UH-1s, uh, they, we called them Razorbacks back then. Why, I don't know, but they were Razorbacks. And they had, they had door gunners All right. sitting on both sides. I, guess, I think they had 50 cows on both sides. Okay. And, uh, and, but I, yeah. and then they had a place called the Heliport, which was driving off base, which was a venture unto itself. If you drive this big, long fuel truck off the base, you have a lot of... Um, the Vietnamese citizens don't pay any attention, no matter how big a vehicle that you're driving. And they're on their little hop tack motor scooters and they're dodging in and out of traffic and they're just crazy and the traffic is nobody everybody's busy going their own way so you, when you drive off base over to the heliport which is a couple miles away you were turning sharp corners so you had to turn wide 
to make the corner, otherwise a truck could fall down in a 10-foot ditch on both sides of the road. And, um, uh, but, you know, you had these motorcycles you had to watch in the, in the mirrors because they'd get right by the wheels. And if you got one of those, those Vietnamese stuck underneath those, those wheels, you got a big problem. Because now they're liable for the, now there's going to be an incident where you killed a, a, a Vietnamese civilian, civilian. With, the, with, the, with the military truck. So you really had to be careful and know everybody cringed when they took a fuel truck over to the heliport and back. So you're making a wide turn and the Vietnamese might be trying to pass you on the right. On the right side. They don't, they don't care. They don't even know. They don't, I don't think they care about their own safety, to be honest with you. They were, they're crazy. Did you have they're some crazy. close calls? Um, I, I <laughs> didn't on my trips, but I know other people did. I almost hit, you hear comments, I almost hit this, I almost hit that person. This person uh, uh, ran right in front of me and I had to jam, slam on the air brakes on the truck. You hear stories like that. I don't ever recall anybody running over anybody. Could have happened, but I just didn't hear about it. Were you driving on pavement or dirt roads? Yeah, or they were, no, they were, it was pavement out, on, out in Saigon. They had paved roads, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, these 10 foot ditch drop offs, uh, that was their sanitation? That's sanitation for them, yeah. That's sanitation. So would you be making those trips in the daytime or nighttime or both? Whenever they call <clears> for <throat> fuel, there could be the night shift could go over to the heliport and have to drive, have to drive those routes, yeah. Did you ever uh, have any problems going to and from the heliport uh, from any enemy fire? No. No, the, the enemy fire we incurred on the base, see, they're not about to actually invade the base because the base provides a lot of black mark, uh, market uh, business outside the gates and a lot of GIs participated in that uh, willingly or unwillingly. Well, give me an example of that. And so that, well, if you, if, you, if you go off base and you go out and you buy something from any place, could be connected to uh, making money so that they could buy their, enemy could buy their rice, their AK-47s. You're putting money in the enemy's hands, perhaps, depending on what you buy, where you buy. A lot of them were Vietnamese and uh, North Vietnamese regular Viet Cong uh, collaborators. Okay. Charlie would work the fields with the ox and the rice paddies during the day and he would, he would kill you at night. That's the way it was. You didn't know who was Charlie. Yeah. You could be talking to Charlie <laughs> out in Saigon. Charlie could be killing you that, somewhere out uh, that, that night. night. Yep. Couldn't, they didn't wear uniforms. Right. Viet Cong didn't. North Vietnamese regulars did. Yeah. So did you have much uh, interaction with, uh, with the citizens? No. No, not no, not too much. I, because of the probability, well, because of the possibility of satchel charges. Uh, they'll go down the street on a on a little motorcycle, and take a, a backpack with full of explosives and throw it in a specific door of a shop. Boom, dead. I really didn't want to subject myself to that, so I didn't go out into Saigon very often. Did. Uh the base have any uh, Vietnamese uh, workers on base? Very much so. All the mama sons, all the women that took care of your, you gave her $10 a month and you buy her black shoe polish to keep your boots black, you buy her Tide to wash your clothes, hand washed, put up on clotheslines. There was no washer and dryer. You're right. Uh, you bought her um, a brush to shine your shoes, you bought her spray starch. And um, they had an area in each barracks that was for them to do their thing. So they would, they would take the wash and baskets out and they would do the laundry out, outside. And then uh, they, in, in the barracks area, they would shine your shoes. They would go to each cubicle and get their boots and shine them and put them back. And they would um, get the fatigues after they washed them. They take them off the line, bring them in. They had an ironing board, and nothing. They didn't sit and they didn't stand. They squatted. So they had a real low ironing board that was at floor level, 
and they had to iron. They could plug it in because we had electric in the barracks, and they ironed and spray starched our fatigues and then hung them back up on our, in our cubicle on the, on the bed rail uh, there. Did they have to do that every day for each guy? Yeah, they, well, they pretty much had a round robin. They do this portion today, they do this group in their barracks, and they had two, if, they, if it was a large barracks, they had maybe four mamasans doing those. If it was a small barracks like I lived in, we had two mamasans. One took one half of the barracks, one took the other half of the barracks. And they had, they had to wear government badges. They were checked out by the government, so you saw them with badges on tell you that they belonged there. Did they live on base? No, they lived off base, but they came on base. They, the guard, the base guard, would let them on base, Have and they to. checked the badge out. All they right. let them on base, and they'd walk over to the, we were right inside the main gate of Saigon. So, main gate of Tonsonut, uh, uh, our barracks area. Were these young girls, middle-aged women, older women? Uh, all ages, all ages. You had young girls doing that job, uh, and you know, and you know, you had your thirties and forties, and you had mama sons who were well over their fifties, doing doing the work. Yeah. Uh, did you learn any Vietnamese uh, from these no. women? No, just uh, slang. You boku number ten. Boku comes from the French occupancy, much many. Number 10, if you're number one, you're the best. If you're number 10, you're, you're the worst. <laughs> so they went by number scale. You boku number 10 means you're a lot bad. That's how that translates in did slang you, language. Did you have any boku number ones? Um, I n I, no, uh, no. I know boku salme, I don't believe you. That's how that translates out. That's pretty much all I remember, you know. Uh, did you try to communicate, or did they try to communicate with you? Did you have any interpreters? That no, you... there were no interpreters around. You just kind of, you just kind of did what you could, trying to communicate. You point to something, or, you know, um, they they used to the Mama Sons used to cook their Vietnamese food in the barracks too, and I, I remember smell. many times. Oh, I remember many times. When I got up, it would the smell would wake me up. They would have a hot plate that they plugged in on the floor. They'd have a pan, and they were cooking some kind of Vietnamese veggies and chicken and whatever in there. But the but the the stuff they used, they had it in what what looked like it was a dark color, looked like Worcestershire sauce. But it was called nook nook mom nook nook mom, and I tell you, it smelled. You ever had a dog get in your face? Dog's breath. <laughs> it smelled. I woke up many mornings to the smell of dog's breath in their in their food, dog dog's breath. Yeah, nasty. So how was the food over there when you were uh, there? I don't know. I ate American food on base, or as close to American food as you. Well, how was it? I well, I I used to instead of the chow hall was a mile and a half, two miles from from our our barracks area. So it took. It was too much trouble to go clear down to the chow hall. Plus, the chow hall, the way it was set up, there were more flies in the chow hall than there were uh, troops. And the coffee, they put the coffee on in a great big vat that had burners on it. And I think Monday it was fine. By Friday, the coffee was so strong they didn't need the pot for it to stand up. It, <laughs> it, it, I think it was the same coffee. I think they probably changed it out on Monday. I'm not sure. But the so and the flies down there and the and the uh, Kool Aid they had in the little stirring machines, I, it just wasn't worth going down. So, conveniently, they had a little shop, little sandwich shop where you could get subs, right around the barracks area. And I used to go and they were cheap; they were like fifty cents a piece. So I'd get a couple of subs, but the sub, but it was different. They were made with rice bread. We, we they didn't have wheat bread and and the bread that we're used to, they, it was made with rice bread, so it was a little harder bread than normal. But nevertheless, the subs were very good, so I used to go get a couple of subs for my meals. And I, I pretty much stuck to those the whole year I was there, eight sub sandwiches. So what'd you have to drink? Do you have any alcohol over there? Oh, there was plenty of booze, plenty of booze. How about beer? A lot of, lot, lot of beer. You could go to the BX and you could buy cases of beer Usually drinking over there, Pabst Blue Ribbon or Schlitz. 
uh, is what I saw a lot of over there. Um, a lot of Jack Daniels. Um, uh, uh, a lot of Seagrams. As a matter of fact, here's the deal right here. This ribbon right here on this hat, that's off, I think, a Seagram's VO bottle. I'm not sure. And that was a sign when I put that on this hat. What that told everybody, if somebody had that on their hat, was you have less than 30 days left in country. Oh. There's 48-year-old hat with a 48-year-old Seagram's VO uh, ribbon on it, signifying signifying my uh, 30 days or less in, well, in country. Show us what else is on the hat. Well, there's some, uh, just a Vietnam logo. I got Vietnam 6970 and a Let's picture of the country. Sh show that to the camera. Vietnam 6970. I got Vietnam on the other end of the hat. I just got, I just random stuff that I put on there. Popeye, uh, Grim Reaper, Smiley Face, VO Ribbon, uh, Pirates logo. Uh, Pittsburgh Viet Pirates? No, just just a Pirates logo, okay. a real pirate. Um, got a Vietnam Veterans pin and something that's not appropriate nowadays, but I got a walking pink finger, which was okay back then, 48 years ago. That wasn't even thought to be that bad, but now, you know. But anyhow, I left it on because it's original. The, I left uh, it on because the it's Vietnam original. Bad button or, or yeah, yeah, you know, uh, Vietnam. That, is that I put, something you were given, or did I, you buy it? I that? put that on afterwards. I put that on afterwards. I got all of these at the local shop where I bought the hat. It was at a shop in Vietnam, uh, and I had had them put this on. This was not Air Force military issued. This was something I bought in remembrance of my experience there. And I have it hanging on the wall of my house, uh, my home, as a, just a reminder that I was there and something of my past 48 years ago. How about the weather? Did you go through any monsoons over there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you went through monsoon season over there. They had their wet season and they had their hot, dry season. And their wet season, um, it, it was strange because um, it would be sunny out uh, like it is here, then all of a sudden for, from nowhere a storm would blow in and it would rain like crazy. I mean, it would flood the area. And um, uh, not, not so much that you couldn't get vehicles through or anything, but it, it, would make, uh, it would just saturate the area. Then it would clear up after about 15 or 20 minutes and it would be sunny, but the problem is it would be hotter after the rain than it was before the rain, or at least it seemed to be. But an interesting thing that I saw after a rain, when I was out on the, on the road one time coming back from the, ba from the flight line, it's a delicacy for Papa San over there in Vietnam. They have rice bugs, they're about that big, they're like locusts around here, only bigger. They have pinchers on the front and that's to crack the rice kernels. They're rice bugs. And they would, after a rain, they would come, the, the, the pavement was so hot, the rain would cool it and there would be steam coming off the pavement because of the cooling effect of the rain. Well, that would also, the, the heat and the steam would attract the rice bugs out of the, out of the tall grass on both sides of the road. They would come out on the pavement. So when, when the cars would drive over, you hear all these crackling Pop, pop, pop. Pop, pop, <laughs> pop, where all the rice bugs were getting mashed. Well, one time I saw Papa San, older Vietnamese guy, come out, grab a rice bug, and start chewing on it just like we would chew on chewing tobacco. It was a delicacy, at least to him. Was it live? So, yeah, he took it alive off the, off the pavement and, and just ate it. Just oh, chewed geez. it like, had a wad, just like chewing tobacco. Oh, oh, yeah, delicacy, rice bugs. Yeah, I remember that. But you never tried one. No, 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 no. But uh, and, but out on the flight line when it was hot and 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 June, July, and August and nearby, yeah, it was it was easily 120, 130 degrees with all that concrete out on the flight line. Yeah, it was hot. 
So we spent all our time, we had fatigue pants and jungle boots, but we could wear a t-shirt. All right. We didn't have to wear a fatigue shirt. Now we did when we came off the flight line, went back to our barracks, we put our shirt back on. But when you're working out on a flight line, knowing it's that hot, yeah, they let us just wear a t-shirt out there. So I was pretty much in a t-shirt my whole year out there. Now, uh, you'd, you'd send some of these transports out and when they would come back, did uh, any of the transports come back with wounded or, or, uh, yes. or f fatally yeah. injured uh, troops? Yes. Um, the Sadly, the one time that I was um, refueling an aircraft, the back hatch of an aircraft came down and they brought what if you if you remember um, uh, the the little uh, tractor and the baggage carts at the airports, right. and they were bringing black body bags off and putting them on these carts to take to the base morgue. So yeah, that 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 and um, them lobbing a couple of rockets in on the base a couple of times a night and the sirens would go off. Uh -huh. That's about as close to the real war as I got in uh -huh. a support role. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's that was war reality of war. Uh, another another time reality of war hit me was I was uh, back hatch went down, and I was refueling a C-130 that was part head headed into a revetment on a flight line. Now, back, are, you, are you refueling the aircraft when the when it drops no, down? The, no, the back hatch comes down. They got to get off the plane first. Then you start refueling okay. the aircraft for okay. safety reasons. Okay, so. I'm, I'm standing there waiting to refuel the aircraft and the back hatch goes down and all these troops get off and they're covered with red mud from head to toe. Never forget it. And the look in their eyes, they had loaded M16s they were carrying off the aircraft. And the look in their eyes were the look of people under stress, people kind of not really there. And so, you didn't say anything to them because you didn't know what frame of mind they were in, plus they were holding a loaded M16. So I didn't say anything to them when they got, when they deplaned. I went ahead and refueled, but at, before I got back in the truck, they went, got out of the plane, they went to a building called the in-country terminal. And the in-country terminal was just flights within country, obviously more for Vietnamese civilians than anything else, but they, and they had like bus station benches in there like church pew benches, uh -huh. and they were all sitting in there, and those guys were just, had a can of pop, or a, they had a ice cream cone, or they were just, but they were staring, and it was the weirdest thing. They were, it, it, like they were in a trance. And so I, I just went in there, and I just kinda, wow, it's this, that really, sending them out there in the jungle and then bringing them back once in a while really traumatizes these guys. They, they, these guys have to be acting the way they were. These guys have been through hell. So that made you glad that uh, you went in the Air Force instead of the I was the glad ground. I was in the Air Force where I was. If you had to go to Vietnam, it was real nice compared to what those guys went through. It was real nice to have a bed to sleep in, uh, to have a shower to take, to have food to eat, and to feel somewhat safe, a lot safer than they were, that's for sure, or at least somebody wasn't shooting directly at you. So, um, yeah. How many times did you have that experience where you saw these guys getting off just, the plane? Just one time that time, but I, and just one time with the, with the body bags being mm -hmm. taken off the aircraft. Just one time, one time's enough to, yeah. you know, it's in, your, it's, it's in my memory and I'll never forget it. So how did you how did you get out of Vietnam? Uh, did you fly, take a boat, or what? Yeah, nope, flew. Um, left from the same base. Let, left from uh, uh, Saigon Airport at the time, interna international airport. Um, uh, left from the same taxiway that I came over on. I came over on Braniff Airlines, as I said before, but I left on an airline called Seaboard World. And uh, when we got on, there was about 300 guys that got on. They were all mixed branches. They were Navy, Army, Air Force, and Marines. And um, I can remember, uh, um, I can remember before we got on. Here's another story. I can remember we all got in a line, and 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 we were. It was not all Air Force, all Navy. It was mixed branches. So we just formed a line, 
and the MPs, the Army MPs, went through your luggage before you got on the plane. To make sure you weren't. These are in the days back. before everything was scanned and all that. You just hand MPs, you opened your suitcase up, um, and um, they went through your stuff and okayed you and they moved you through. Well, what are well, they looking for? They're looking for weapons, and that's where my story comes into play. There was a uh, Army captain. And I don't know why he did this. He knew better. Big signs up there. No weapons beyond this point. He had a low. He had a 45. And the MP got 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 a hold of that weapon, pulled it out of the suitcase, looked at that captain, and said, jumped all over him. What is this? Loaded 45. And they took the captain out of line. Took him somewhere. I don't know. But he never made it. He never went ahead of me. So yeah. Yeah, loaded 45, and he, he's no better than that. Mm -hmm. He's no better than that. So, uh, anyhow. Did you bring back any souvenirs from uh, Vietnam? Any, I, any trinkets that you bought? I brought or? back Vietnamese money, piaster and dongs, and I have them in that book. Uh, I brought back a Vietnamese butterfly that I had, that I found. Uh, and of course, my pictures and my hat. And um, I can't. I can't. I don't think I. I brought back a calling card from the Shadows, that group of um, of um, gunships that only flew at night that uh -huh, I referred to. Uh -huh. They. One of the crew members gave me a calling card that's in that book, and it says something about when uninvited guests drop in, meaning the enemy, call us. The Shadow knows. <laughs> And it has a it has a black figure shining a flashlight down. Yeah, the shadow knows. So and that was that was something I kept and put in my book. Well, there used to, I can remember as a kid there used to be a radio program called The Shadow, shadow and that's exactly what uh, what the program said. Mm -hmm. The shadow knows. Yep. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? Well, the shadow knows. True. So uh, where'd you land when you came back? Uh, Took a different route back than we took over. Uh, went from Travis to Hawaii to Philippines to Guam to Vietnam. Over, came back the northern route. Came back. Uh, we took off from uh, Tonsonut in Saigon. Flew to Masawa, Japan, to the Air Force Base in Masawa, Japan. Got there at night. At night, and the only thing I remember are the blue taxi lights. Every every time I landed, it seemed like I, we landed at night, and I didn't get to see anything except for the next uh, stop. That was Anchorage, Alaska, the northern route. And I remember getting off and it was about 50 degrees and they were having a good time. That was warm to them. But we just got done spending a year in a tropical climate at 110 degrees and we were cold. Freezing to death. Freezing at 50 degrees. I remember getting off the plane. No coat. We just had our, we had 10 traveling, you, tra you didn't travel in fatigues like, you, like the, the troops can now. You weren't allowed to wear your fatigue, so you had travel in 1505s, your tan dress uniforms. We all had our summer 1505s on, freezing to death. So what, one of the things, we had a hold up at that airport, it was daytime, actually arrived at, during the daylight. But now the Anchorage uh, airport, the, the officials somehow got the brilliant idea that they wanted to see our shot records before we uh, were allowed back to fly back into the United States, which would have next stop would have been Anchorage, Alaska, down to Travis in California, Travis Air Force Base. Before they let us back in the country, we went to see our shot records. The shot records were in our duffel bags in the hold of the aircraft. You'd got 300 guys anxious to get home from after a year in Vietnam. They want to get home and get back to their the people. So we raised such a stink about it, after a while they gave up on that idea, said it would take too long, didn't want to infuriate 300 guys, so they said, never mind, get back on the aircraft, go back, go down to California. So that's what happened. But there was a, there was a hold up there longer than what we wanted, because uh -huh. we were all anxious to get back home, yeah, because of shot records in the, in the duffel bags in the hold of the aircraft. Yep. So you get to Travis and... Uh, Got to Travis. Um, uh, could have stayed, was anxious to get home. The adrenaline was, was flowing. Uh, just got done with a, with a, gosh, I don't know what it was. I, was it an 18 hour flight over? I don't know what, how many hours it was coming back. Quite a long trip. 
uh, but still didn't feel tired, adrenaline flowing, getting back. Totally different feeling going over. Going over was anxiety. Don't know what to expect. What's in Vietnam? We're going to be shot at? What's going to happen? Coming back, I already did our time, couldn't get any tougher than this. So anything from here on is gravy. So, so we were in a different frame of mind. Um, cab fare was about 60 bucks from Travis Air Force Base to San Francisco Airport. Uh, shared it with two other guys. We all chipped in 20 bucks. Took the cab ride. That was at night. Remember going over the, the bridge, looking down at the lights of San Francisco. Remember, I think, red lettering, San Francisco Airport, International Airport, something like that, I think. Uh, got my, bought my ticket, got my flight. Didn't come back here to Ohio immediately. Um, before I went over at Davis Month in Tucson, before I went to uh, Vietnam, I had a, a girlfriend in Tucson, Arizona that I stopped off and saw. So I flew from San Francisco to uh, Tucson Airport. She picked me up there. All right. So I stayed stayed there for a while, and um, and then uh, time was up there, and uh, came back to Middletown. Um, well, you still had some time in your. T t oh four yeah, years. My, my enlistment. Yeah, but yeah. you got back here yeah. to Middletown but before I, but, you had to report. Uh, yeah, yes, got back here. Got back here to Middletown before I had to. Uh, I was on my 30-day leave from Vietnam. After a year, you accrue 30 days. And um, uh, was had my next assignment at Rickenbacker Air Force Base in Columbus. And um, uh, so I, I came back to town. Um, those were back in the days when soldiers and veterans and recognizing them were not a popular thing because everybody was mad at the Vietnam War. So you being in the military, you were not a very popular person, as did, society goes. And did you personally experience any no, adverse? No, I, I never experienced the shouting of the, what you have heard on the news, baby killer, you know, uh, uh, being spit on. I never experienced any of that. I never saw it done. I never heard it. I, I really don't know anybody that was spat upon, that was called a baby killer or names. I just know that uh, you there was no recognition like there is nowadays. It's you know thank you for your service is a is a uh, relatively new thing that has come on on the uh, horizon for society now. And um, first time I heard it a couple years ago, I was kind of I kind of took a second second uh, look at it because I I was I was shocked because I have never heard thank you for your service after all these years. It wasn't popular when I was in. So did the balance of uh, your four years up to uh, your discharge in uh, March of 72, mm -hmm. uh, was all that time spent at Rickenbacker? Yes from, the, yes, from the time I got back from Vietnam to the time I went to my next permanent party base was, uh, was spent at Rickenbacker and I was discharged at Rickenbacker. My last day in the Air Force, I drove off the base of Rickenbacker and, drove, and came back back to Middletown. Well, while you were in Rickenbacker, uh, did, the, <laughs> did the Air Force give you a chance to use the technical training that you had received uh, on the job in, in fuels? Yeah, um, I had, uh, before you, before you um, decide to um, uh, separate from the military then, uh, I, you, ha you do some out processing and you go to all these different places on base and they sign off that yes, you've been here, and yes, you've turned in this, you've signed that, whatever. One of the stops was to see a, a master sergeant, and he was his job was to try to he his job is to try to keep eligible people from uh, and having them reenlist. They didn't want them to um, leave the service. That was his job to persuade me to reenlist. And I had an interesting conversation with him. I can remember it vividly. And I told him, and I knew he couldn't honor this, there was no way he could make this happen for me, but I went ahead anyway. I said, well, I made four stripes in three years and two months. I would like to make E6 tech sergeant in the next two years and E7 master sergeant in the next two years. That's eight years as a master sergeant. There is no way that you're gonna do that. 
uh, even making it, making it minimum time and grade. I just don't think there's enough time to, that you would have to make both those ranks. And they just don't, the higher you go, the less stripes are given out and the harder it is to make rank. And I said, and I also want to cross train. I want to change my AFSC, Air Force Specialty Code. I said, uh, I want to get out of fuels. He says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, and I want to be a drill instructor, and I want to yell at people. He <laughs> says, why do you want to do that? And I said, where in the heck else can you go to have 40 people think you're God and under total control? I said, that would just tickle me to no end to do that. He says, well, you, but you can't make the rank that you're wanting in that career field. And I said, I know that. And I said, I also know that this conversation is futile. But I thought I'd give it a shot before I left. <laughs> he said, I can't match that. And I said, well, I'll sign this. And I signed it and I ended up out processing, driving off base for the last time. Uh -huh. That was it. So what was your highest rank then? E-5 Staff Sergeant. Staff Sergeant. Mm -hmm. Um, and you were in the Seventh Air Force uh, PACAF. Yeah, but I was in. I was also in TAC, Tactical Air Command. I was also in SAC, Strategic Air Command. Okay. And every time you change commands, you had to take this patch off your pocket and put the new patch on your fatigues. So yeah, at Rickenbacker, uh, when I first went to the base, it was SAC, and then they changed to TAC. And I hated that when that happened because. TAC was big on calling alerts. They'd call alerts and the siren would go off and the base would be closed and all the exits to the base. Whoever was on base was locked on base. Whoever was off base couldn't get on base. And it lasted through an entire weekend. Oh. So the last thing you wanted to do if you were a single guy wanting to come home back to Middletown on the weekend, you know, Columbus is just a two and a half hour drive up here. Um, I wanted to come home and spend a weekend here in Middletown and when if the alarm went off, uh, the uh, siren went off and locked you in, you couldn't get off base to come home. You spent your entire weekend on base. Well, then, yeah, I was wanting to get out anyway. So, and uh, doing the Air Force thing, I was a short timer. I wanted to come home. So I got caught at a couple of those one time, didn't say, couldn't say as I liked it. So I, I started getting a little better at the game. So I left work on a Friday early, went to the barracks, took off my fatigues, changed into my civilian clothes, which is the only way you could leave the barracks, unless you lived off base. And I got in my car and I beat the siren. So I, I, I left the base at Three o'clock, they'd usually do the sirens at four, four thirty when everybody was just about ready to leave. They'd lock them down at the last minute. So I, I learned, I learned what they were doing. So I, I countered it by you, leaving earlier. You beat the system. I beat the system. Yep. And once you're off base, it's okay, just keep going. Can't get back on anyway. Right. So uh, you uh, you drive off base for the last time, and uh, you come back to Middletown. Uh, I, I came back. I came back to visit uh, my family, uh, and I stayed in Middletown for a while. But then, uh, then I went back up to Columbus, because Kath and I uh, got married, and and we ended up wanting to live up in Columbus in the bigger city. All right. Yeah. So, so my Middletown uh, uh, at that time, um, Middletown was just a, an occasional weekend visit with her, she and I come down here to see my family right. on a weekend visit. So uh, what what was your first job then as a civilian and take us through your employment okay. when, you, when you got out of uh, active duty, uh, where all did you work and what did you do? Okay, um, when, <laughs> I, when I first uh, came off of active duty, uh, I spent several months trying to find a job and the best I could do at the time was work as, a, as an insurance agent for equitable life insurance. They were on Broad Street there in Columbus and it was a collection agency. So I went out, got in my car and went to kind of like a poorer area of Columbus and tried to collect 50 cents a week premiums from people, dollar a week premiums. I actually had to get out of the car, go up to the door and knock on the door for 
five bucks for a for a month's premium or something. And so I I worked that for a few and I'm not a salesman. I can't pitch I can't pitch it selling insurance is hard anyway because you're selling something that's going to do something for somebody not right away but long term and they usually never keep up with the premiums and ends up la lapsing anyway. Well did so, you have a hard time getting a job, job because of your Vietnam? Uh, no, I just had a hard time. It it wasn't necessarily um, you didn't necessarily have uh, an advantage of hire the vet. That wasn't really big then. But anyhow, uh, I did that for a while and, and my neighbor said, well, they're hiring a crane plastics. How would you like to do factory work? And I said, yeah, I did a little factory work years ago, but before my military, but, uh, but um, uh, I'll give it a try. So I, employed, I, I went for employment at Crane, ended up getting on there I worked from uh, 1972 to 79 at Crane Plastics. Like I said, operating a forklift, running an extruder, um, working as an in-the-line auditor and doing uh, research and development work in the lab. They took me in the lab because I had lab experience in the Air Force in a fuels lab. Uh, worked there until 79, at which time I took another job with more pay in Newark, Ohio, 30 miles east of Columbus. And uh, I helped set up a lab. They built a new plant, polycarbonate compounding plant, in an industrial park in Newark. And I was setting, up, helping the lab supervisor set up the lab, uncreating new equipment, setting up lab procedures, that kind of thing. So I worked there. From Did you live in Newark then? Lived in Newark. We uh, sold our house in Columbus, <laughs> bought a house in Newark, lived there from '79 to '84. Uh, Did you? '85, '85. Did you and Kathy have kids? No, we were on the adoption list out of Columbus for 10 years. And uh, we had kind of given up on having kids. Um, so, uh, and all of a sudden, this is one of the little surprises in life that comes up and hits you. Uh, I'm working second shift at Mobay Chemical in the lab and I'm home sleeping at 11 o'clock in the morning, the telephone rings. Kath has already, is already working at a place called Ohio, Ohio Oil and Gas Association as an administrative assistant. She calls and she says, how are you, Dad? And I said, what do you mean by Dad? <laughs> she says, um, well, I just want to tell you, Dad, that um, they're bringing out our three-day-old private adoption son at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, and I said, what? Yeah, we we now have a little three-day-old boy that they're that the social worker and lawyer are bringing out. It's a private adoption. It's from a couple who can't have kids, and they want to adopt their son out to people who can't have kids. Uh -huh. They couldn't take care of him. They were not financially. They were 18-ish, and they couldn't take care of the of of him. So in four, we she came home from work. I took vacation day suddenly because of the situation. We went out and set up a nursery and bought formula and diapers and everything in four hours before they came brought him out. So you're working at Mobay? I'm working at Mobay Chemical. Now is that in Newark? That's in Newark. That's actually in Hebron, which is a little town right next to uh, Newark. Right. Off of I-70 East. And uh, well, yeah. 40 goes right through Hebron, doesn't it? it yes, I believe it does. Yeah. National Road. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. <clears throat> and, and so, yeah, so I'm, I'm working at Mobay Chemical. She's working at Ohio Oil and Gas, and here comes three-day-old Scott, and all of a sudden we're instant parents. Before she had her car, I had my car. I went to play slow pit softball seven days a week. She went with her friends out. We were independent, said hi to each other, and, and a kind of a, kind of a, um, a um, free, easy living lifestyle, and all of a sudden now we have a family to take care of and a, and a son. Now we have to find babysitting arrangements and I have to take care of him during the day while she works and then I, I worked afternoon shift. I would take him up to a house in back of us. She would watch him for a couple hours. Kath would come home from work, pick him up at five. I'd drop him off at 2.30 in the afternoon. He was only there about an hour and a half, two hours, something like that. She would pick him up, bring him home for the evening. Then we'd do it all over again. All right. So how, how long uh, did you stay in Newark uh, working at that place, working yeah, at Mobay? 1979 to 1985, and then uh, then found a job in uh, Cincinnati Procter & Gamble, working in research and development as a lab technician, and uh, was in product development working on sure and secret antiperspirants. 
And what's Kath doing? And Kath, now Kath is still working in Ohio oil and gas when I first took the Proctor job. So I lived down here with my aunt and uncle, my uncle Bill, who was the Marine Corps pilot uh -huh. on Orchard Street. I stayed with them Monday through Friday. Then Friday, I left from work in Cincinnati, drove straight back home to Newark, spent the weekend with Scott and Kath. Uh, shortly after I did that, a few months after I was doing that, she found a job, got a job at Procter & Gamble. But I worked at Sherwood's Technical Center in Blue Ash over off Reed Hartman Highway on the east side. She worked at Winton Hill on the west side. So where did you, you buy a house? Okay, we bought a house here in Middletown up on Stratford Drive in the north end of Middletown, just north of the high school. So you'd both have to drive to work from Middletown? Yeah, we both drove down to Cincinnati. She would drive her car west on 275, and I would go east on 275. Then we got smart. She says, I'll just transfer from Winton Hill over to Sherwood Woods. We'll ride together, save on time and money. Okay. So she came over to Winton Hill, uh, from Winton Hill to Sherwood Woods. She worked upstairs in cost engineering as an administrative assistant. I worked downstairs as a lab technician in product development. So where's Scott going to school then? Scott's going to school at, um, uh, where, where did he go to school? He, he started out at, um, he went to Vail Middle School downtown, the old, my old high school. And then he, he went to, uh, uh, when he got into high school, he didn't care for the climate at the, at the Middletown High School at Umbreal. Uh So he, he ended up, we requested him go to Garfield alternative school, alternative okay. high school. Okay. So he went there and uh, he did much better there. He liked, he liked the teaching methods there, the more open environment, the expression part of it. Uh, he, he didn't like the regiment of the high school where everybody had to act the same and do, and do that kind of thing. So did he graduate from Garfield then? Uh, yeah, he, he went to Garfield alternative school and got his high school diploma there. And then um, he worked at uh, Lone Star Steakhouse out here on uh, by the freeway as their cook out there for years. And then um, then decided to leave there. He went and then he went to school to Sinclair College up in Dayton. In Dayton, and he's got two years in, and I'm trying to encourage him now to go back to school. We live up here, uh, and he can be at Miami University for his other two years in a two minute drive, the car engine wouldn't even get warm before he'd be at school. It's right around the block from where we live up, up in the north side Miami of town. Miami University, Oxford's uh, My, Middletown, Middletown campus. Middletown campus, uh -huh. yeah, would offer his other two years. And his Sinclair credits would transfer That's to he Miami. Married? Is he married or still single? He's married, but separated. Okay, any children? Any no, no children. Okay, so you don't have no any children. grandchildren? No grandchildren. All right. No. And, uh, I'm sorry to hear that uh, Kathy died uh, recently. Yeah, Kath, Kath had a myriad of medical problems. In 1991, she had peripheral vascular disease, clogged arteries. She had a Tigon tube out of her carotid, her aorta, her abdomen, both femorals, five bypass operations by the cardiologist. Then in 96, she had a heart attack. 98, she had a heart attack. Wow. She recovered from those. She went to the hematologist and the hematologist ran some blood tests on her, found out that she had a genetic defect in her blood where she was prone to infections. She had a, a reduced immune system. All right. That led to a couple of atrium hospital stays when her white cell count went out of sight. She was on blood thinners and 12 other medications per day uh, because uh, in October of 2009, she had a major stroke, a massive stroke that paralyzed her left side. Oh, wow. She was wheelchair bound and hospital bed bound at home. Scott and I became her providers from 2009 until she passed in May of 18, just a couple of months ago. So she had a rough way to go and she you had, did too, taking care of her. She had, yeah, I was working a full-time job at uh, University of Dayton Research Institute up at Wright-Patterson. Uh, coatings group, putting experimental coatings on Air Force aircraft and then testing them. Uh, I would come in the door, I would leave at five in the morning uh, to drive up to the base to get coffee made and get the lab equipment on and everything before people came in. I would get home at 4.30 in the afternoon as soon as I walked in the door I would start taking care of her because Scott had taken care of her all day. 
uh -huh. during the day. He was set up in the basement. He's got a full finished basement down there with a bedroom, bath, kitchen, the whole thing down there. He's got another house downstairs and he's still living there to this day. Oh, that's that's and, nice. And yeah, and um, um, so he took care of her during the day. I take, took care of her during the evening hours and giving her pills, getting her prescriptions, getting her food, bathing her, taking her to her doctor's appointments. Uh, trying to go to the grocery, in between there trying to get the sweeper run, the dishes done, the laundry done, the grass cut, the cars washed. You were Mr. Mom. I was, I was so busy, I, I didn't know um, where I was supposed to be at any given moment at, at times during those nights. I don't know how I did it looking back. Well, we kind of got lost the last, yeah. time, last time we were talking about work. Mm -hmm. Uh, you were Procter & Gamble, and now you're up at uh, oh, UD, UD yeah. RI. Yeah, UD. Uh, <coughs> when did you leave uh, okay, Procter & Gamble? Procter & Gamble, I worked there uh, from 85 to 94. Uh, they had a downsizing. I was caught in the downsizing. Uh, left there, went to work at Neaton Auto Products in Eaton, Ohio as a lab supervisor. They had a nice, pretty, clean-looking lab that was inactive. They wanted me to activate it. With all the lab experience I had, I went ahead and activated that for them. I stayed there from 94 to 98. The Japanese, for me, were extremely hard to work for. Uh, they had a different manufacturing culture than I was used to, used to uh, dealing with. So I left there in 98, went to work for General Cable in Highland Heights, Kentucky in a physical property testing laboratory in plastics, vinyl plastics there. They had a downsizing. So I went from one downsizing to another, and so um, uh, so then I got a job. Let's see, I, uh, General Cable. Okay, General Cable, and then I went to work for uh, Thermo Black Clawson here in Middletown. They had a, la a, re a technical center on Jefferson Street over here, where they demonstrated their their paper making equipment. So now I learned. I learned plastics testing. I learned aviation fuels testing. Now I've learned I've learned testing in uh, the freight cosmetics business. Uh, now I'm going to learn paper testing. I've learned a whole lot of things uh, in the 48 years I've worked. Um, but um, so now I'm uh, so now I'm going to work Clawson. for I'm at Black Clawson. We're in the demonstration group at the Tech Center on Jefferson Street, which they have since shut down. They moved to Mon Mason Montgomery Road uh, since then, moved out of Middletown. And we, uh, they, they were having less and less customers come in to have things demonstrated for them, so they, it was costing them a lot of money to keep it open. Shut that down, and that was another downsizing. Luckily, our whole fiber technology group from Black Lawson, they were setting up a fiber technology group at International Paper on Ward's Corner Road in Loveland on the east side of Cincinnati. So we all went as a, in mass as a group, and we were all technicians, all started at the same time, same day, same group. All we did was move from this job up to that job, made more money doing it. So uh, worked there from 2002 to 2004. At that time, my family, Scott, Kath, and I decided, hey, let's have a lifestyle change. We want to change everything radically. Going to sell our house in Middletown. Going to quit my international paper job. We're going to move to Tucson, Arizona, where we've been a couple of times on vacation. That way, I'll already be, will already be retired. When I retire, we'll already be retired at our at our retirement home out in Tucson, where it's nice weather year-round. A little hot in the summer. Well, I went out there. I still needed to work, so I tried to find a job out there. Uh, for some spending money out there, and I could not find anything that I cared for, that I liked, that was in my career field. We spent eight months out there, and the same jobs that were in the paper in the first part of the eight months were the same jobs that were there at the end of the eight months. Nothing was getting any better for us. Couldn't see anything on the horizon. Ended up talking over with the family. We ended up selling that house, coming back, stayed in an apartment out here by the freeway, uh, for a while until I found the University of Dayton Research Institute job. Well, how did you, how did you find Patterson. that? I found that out because they advertised in the newspaper that they needed a research technician up at Wright-Patterson. It was in the, this research area. 
A lot of the testing the coatings does, they do in plastics. I went up there and told them that. They took me, they, they took me for a, had an interview and a walkthrough. A couple weeks later, they offered me a job. I took it, worked up there for a little over 12 years. Then I retired this past October from there. Now I've called them because uh, since my wife passed away, I lost her social security income while I have my social security income, it's enough to take care of the bills per month. I still like to have some spending money. Uh -huh. I have called my old group back up at the base to go back full time. They have a company policy where they don't hire retirees full time anymore. Okay. So I can go back part time, two days a week. All right. And so I have done that. I have got that in the works. They are waiting for the paperwork to be, done, uh, to be completed and approved, the government has approved it because my pay will come off a government contract up there. Some of my work will come off UD's uh, contracts. That's been approved. So all it needs is the, is the big shots at U UD to sign the paperwork and I'm gonna go back up there and work in my old group with my old people oh, two days a week, great. spending I money. I graduated from UD. Spending money, yep. Many years ago, yep. but uh, that, that'll be nice. It'll give you something to do, give you some Get out of the house and, and get you socialize uh, again socialize because him. when my son goes to work during the day, it's awful lonely in that house without her around anymore. So, yeah. Well, let's go off, off the record here for a minute. All right, we're back on the camera. So, uh, what are you showing us there, Terry? This is a, a, a hop tack, and it's in downtown Saigon, and you gave Papa San. Uh, 50 cents and he'll take you all over the city for as long as you want to go wherever you want to go. This is a picture of me and I, I'm up on the upper floors of the Navy BOQ building in downtown Saigon. I What's just, a BOQ? Well, I, I, that's a good question. It's a Navy billets area. It's just where the Navy, some of the Navy personnel stay. Uh, other than that, I don't know. I, somebody just told me it was there, so I just out of curiosity, I was exploring the building and got a nice view of, of uh, Saigon from there. Okay. Is, is that a picture of one of your Mama Sons? That's a picture of, of Mama San uh, uh, that took care of our laundry and our shoe shining and our uh, uh, fatigue pressing. And uh, she was washing clothes and hanging them out on the line. Uh, outside the, the latrine area in our barracks area. Did you have the same one all the time or did they, yeah, did the, they change? Yeah, the, the same Mama Sons manned the same buildings, the same barracks every day. Mm -hmm. all, during the, all during the year you all, were there? All during the year, uh -huh. yes. And uh, yeah, now this one, this is a picture of me. I'm in, I'm in one of the cubicles in the barracks and uh, I am, uh, and what I had done was um, through the BX, I had ordered a 1970 Jaguar XKE. And uh, it is this, uh, behind me is a picture of the Jaguar XKE, only I ordered a red one, that's Willow Green, I think. Uh, and that was waiting at home for me when I got home to Middletown after my tour. It was 6,100 bucks off the boat from England. Boy, that sounds like that's a, cheap. That sounds like a deal. But uh, and the car ran real well for a year and a half. Beautiful machine, seventy-two spoke wire wheels, uh, leather interior, uh, six-cylinder engine. The whole bonnet lifted up in the front, and monocot uh, suspension to it, and uh, got the looks. But after a year and a half, the Lucas electrical system and the electronics on the British cars fell apart, so I ended up selling it up in Columbus. How old were you in that picture? I was 21. And when did you uh, celebrate your 21st birthday? I, I celebrated my 21st birthday uh, uh, in Saigon on a bunker, drinking past Blue Ribbon beer and watching fireworks in downtown Saigon. All right, well. I think that'll about do it for our interview. I want to thank you 
first for doing I'm the interview. I'm a talkative guy, aren't I? I talk a lot, but that's... Well, I, thanks for doing the interview. And sure, thank you're you for welcome. Thank you for what you did for us over in Thank you. Vietnam. I appreciate that. And thank I'm, you. I'm happy that you uh, made it back here safely. I did. Yes. And, and I kind of set myself up for that. But, um, you know, I, it, it could have been a lot worse. I, I think if I would have waited and gone 1A draft, it would have been Army or Marines and probably, I know a couple guys at high school that uh, Kenny Perry was one of them that I used to be in Cub Scouts with. He didn't make it back. He died about a month before his tour was over. He was Army. And uh, so yeah. it, it could have been that bad. Yeah. You could have been one of the body bags. Yeah, I, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome.